Hi, everyone. Namaste. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening for some people who are joining us today. Uh, this is Rita Dugal, and today we are going to share our research um, on impact of COVID-19 on service providers for people living with HIV, uh, quantitative and qualitative study. And I have my co-presenters here. Hi, I'm Sarah Rich Sendel. Hi, my name is John. Hey. My name is Sarah Thomas. Hello, I'm Bess Yang. We would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and build community on the traditional lands of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and express our gratitude and appreciation for all Indigenous people who live here and share their knowledge with us. We invite you to join us in our ongoing commitments to the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit um, about our research context very briefly. Um, 100 people of um, Alberta diagnosed with HIV every year, and Alberta has the highest, third, third highest rates of HIV in Canada. Um, um, and this is one of the regions we decided to uh, work with service providers who are providing services uh, to social services to the people living with HIV in Alberta. And our research um, uh, um, objective was to address gap in knowledge about how COVID-19 affected the service providers in terms of their working conditions and personal well-being. For the purpose of this research, we utilized a mixed method a research design, quantitative and qualitative paradigms, and it was completely community-based engaged uh, approach. So far, we have uh, 25 participants participated in surveys, and then also we had three focus groups uh, conducted so far, and we are still doing uh, research. This research is going to be continuing. Thank you. Regarding our preliminary survey, they are gathered from 22 respondents with 73% comprised of frontline workers and 27% in leadership roles. We will explain our data through the dual lens of the pandemic's effects on service providers' experience, as well as the pandemic's effects on the, on the individual well-being. In terms of the pandemic's effects on service providers' experience, 77% of respondents reported an increase in the demand for social support programs, and 57% of respondents witnessed an increase in the demand for mental health services. On the contrary, 82% of respondents reported a decrease in their capacity to provide social and mental health support during the pandemic. The most mentioned challenge experienced by the service providers was in meeting the client's demand, which includes both wraparound support services, such as housing, food bank, and basic need services, as well as health services for clients, which include testing, pre-exposure prophylaxis, HIV treatment, as well as specialized, uh, specialist appointments. The second most challenge was related to staff morale. In respect to the effectiveness of organizational support received, all respondents felt that their organization provided them with effective support to a varying extent. In our examination of the pandemic's effects on well-being, 59% of respondents reported a worsening in their social well-being during the pandemic, 55% reported a decrease in their mental health, 41% reported a decrease in their financial health, and 36% reported that their spiritual health worsened. Looking at some of the most highly reported coping skills, they include learning to live with COVID, concentrating efforts on doing something about the situation they're in, expressing one's negative feelings, as well as looking for something good in what is happening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the preliminary findings from our focus groups. Um, and we see a lot of correspondence to some of the results that came from the survey. Uh, first of all, what was really interesting was that participants identified that COVID-19 exacerbated all existing constraints to service provision. So what we discovered was that, in fact, 
Um, many uh, of these organizations were already relatively precarious in terms of funding and have had to be really nimble and COVID-19 exacerbated that. But we also heard about strengths because they've lived in a kind of precarious scenario in terms of provincial funding, staff turnover and other challenges they experience regularly, they were able to uh, pivot very quickly and continue services um, even given uh, the restrictions that were placed upon them during COVID. Uh, in terms of uh, the working space, a lot of um, participants in the focus group described the main challenge for them is feeling very alienated um, from their work. So we know uh, from our participants that um, community and community engagement is a central part of this work, meeting in groups, communing with clients, communing with other staff. And because that disappeared, um, many people described feeling a lack of purpose uh, in their work. Um, and this corresponds to uh, some of the coping strategies and challenges that people identified. So what we found is that our participants had a very high awareness of changes in their well-being as a result of COVID. Um, and they understood well their coping needs and were willing to seek support from each other, um, both inside and outside of work. Um, and they, they really focused on trying to find healthy coping strategies. Uh, but one of the major problems was this sort of social alienation and finding that although um, there were uh, facilities for their mental and physical well-being, there were less facilities for addressing this sort of gap in um, community and uh, socializing. In this slide, we talk about implications and recommendations based on the initial findings in this research. And the first one is to explore the options to continue community-based services provision outdoors, um, because sometimes we realize that one-on-one -on -one services do not really meet the need of some clients. Also doing activities or community-based services outdoors will help continue um, these services that HIV organizations are providing despite not being able to gather inside the offices or inside the organization's building uh, or in a close proximity with each other. And also doing this outdoors will help reach multiple people and not just one or two clients at a time. The next one is focusing on addressing staff social well-being in addition to physical, mental, and emotional health. In this research, we emphasize that physical, mental, emotional health is important and has to be addressed, but we also realize that social well-being or the social health of the staff is very important as well, um, especially not being able to meet with coworkers, um, with clients in person, um, feeling isolated, working at home. So I think it's important to find ways to address and improve the social well-being of the staff. The next one is strengthening relationships on, and coordination between leadership and frontline staff leaders and between organizations. Again, one of the effects of the pandemic is not being able to see each other and not being able to work together closely or in person. Um, yes, we are working virtually through Zoom or other medium online, but the pandemic unfortunately still created that divide um, in a way that, or distance between the staff and the leadership team, also between organizations. So I think part of the social well-being or social health that I was talking about earlier, it's important to look as well how these relationships, especially now that things are getting better and hopefully that continues, um, it's important to find ways to strengthen these relationships now between leaders and frontline staff and other organizations. And we're thinking as well that if we do this, then we'll be able to overcome challenges in the future just in case, you know, like the pandemic lengthens or, you know, like there are different waves, hopefully not, but or other, other challenging times such as COVID-19. And then the last one is uh, we realized or we learned that it's important to invest in research 
on tools and programs that will improve the overall overall health and well-being of the frontline staff and the leaders, especially during challenging times such as the COVID-19 pandemic. We believe that if the staff, the leader, has support or are being provided this support and programs that will improve their overall health, then they'll be able to to do their roles or to do their tasks more effectively. They'll be able to work with clients more effectively. They'll be able to provide services more effectively and they'll be able to work together more effectively within organizations and with other organizations. And for us, that means that being able to be there for the clients, for people who are living with HIV, which is very essential, very important at this time, and very important when things like COVID happen or other challenging times happen in the future. And that concludes our presentation. We would um, like to thank the People Summit for the opportunity to present at this conference, as well as for everyone who has shared their time with us um, and watched our presentation. If there are any questions or comments, um, or you'd like to follow along um, with us as the project continues, uh, you can contact Dr. Rita Dungle.